this discussion is um, um, how important is it when setting up the ME CFS research in the Netherlands is also including special attention for the pediatric patients who suffer from chronic fatigueness. So maybe you can answer this, Jenny, or, or maybe Mike or, or Jonas. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's interesting because you get to see the kids right at the beginning of the illness. So we're actually getting samples from patients even before they get chronic fatigue. So understanding like the differences between before and after fatigue. We also found that there's a high rate of having siblings. So enrolling siblings into studies is really important because again, you can get their samples before they develop the illness and really validating like the beginning of the fatigue illness. I mean, um, I think in adults, it's always, it maybe, I don't know, I don't treat adults. It may be hard to sort of really pinpoint when things happen, maybe not, but in kids, it's very clear when it happens. I mean, it's clear with the school records, it's clear with you know, the teacher reports. It's just very clear that they were fine, absolutely zero fatigue, zero mental health problems, and then bam, their whole life changes. Um, I also think it's important to study the kids because um, because it's they're sort of under their parents' watch, <laughs> it's it is um, you know much easier I think to get well I don't know maybe I think it's 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 for our clinic it seems to be very um, uh, helpful to have the very clear history around the onset of the illness and what's happening in the entire sort of family in terms of infections and other um, potential triggers. Michael, you want to comment on this as well? Sure. Uh, first of all, Dr. Frankovitz, that was really, really interesting. And I'm really glad that you're doing this work. It's, um, it's strange that it was sort of considered really controversial. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, if you talk to these, you know, families, it's really obvious that they're, that this is real, you know, so uh, it's, it's just cool to see you doing this work. Um, oh, for you. the question about, um, uh, the, you know, childhood in MECFS. I think one of the things from our perspective is that this is a really interesting um, and important time to sort of rule out the potential structural problems um, that could be contributing to this syndrome diagnosis. So, um, you know, Dr. Peter Rowe has talked a lot about this during the growth spurt, um, you know, bones and things, ligaments may be compressing jugular vein and uh, you know, things like that. There may be vascular stenosis, spinal stenosis that come out during development. So studying kids from that perspective, I think is also really important for the MECFS side of things to make sure that it's not a misdiagnosis that they end up living with for years, um, uh, just for failure for, for recognizing those issues. That's a really good point. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, Thank you, Michael. You. Jonas, you want to elaborate on this discussion? <clears throat> I just want to say that it's uh, it's extremely interesting ideas and uh, thoughts and uh, in our perspective, I mean, we we think that we have a great value of possibility to monitor over time with tem temporary result sampling. So we can have very early samples collected and then over a couple of yeah, months and then up to several years. And in our ethical permit now, we have added seven years as the long term oh, wow. perspective, which yeah, <laughs> may be a bit... Um, optimistic maybe but i think it's a it's an opportunity to monitor over time in the same individual and monitor and see what happens and mm -hmm. see where the final the where the check shift comes so to say if we can yeah yeah so that's going to be extremely interesting yeah thank yeah. you for sure um i know that lou has a question i don't know whether he will be on the screen or whether Sabine is going to share this question. Um, yes, you can. Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, yeah, I put in a question by Lou for uh, Michael van Elsacker, but he also had a question for Professor Bergvist about how you, well, maybe for all of you, how you define MECFS patients. Do you use different criteria and what does that mean for your findings? Is it a specific group of patients where you found the tryptophan abnormalities? So just as a general um, question, we use the international consensus criteria and we try to use you know, multiple criteria and we also work with a, an MD uh, who's been working with these patients for 40 years. So we get sort of a, 
referrals from that clinic that, you know, she's really good at ruling out alternative diagnoses. Uh, and then we use the international consensus criteria. Yeah, we do so also. Uh, sometimes we see that we have subgroups in our uh, biomarker data set. So, of course, uh, sometimes we are a bit more inclusive when it comes to screening for new hypotheses. But when it comes to validating the findings, we need to be extremely strict and follow, as Mike said, uh, the accepted criteria and uh, try to rule out everything else, basically. And when it comes to the subgroups of uh, with tryptophan metabolism, it's a bit too early for me to say yet. Uh, uh, we see that there is a disturbance in this pathway, uh, but we need to go through much more more patients to see where 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 this is heading really. But this will be one of the inclusion criteria for the clinical trial that we have a disturbed uh, tryptophan metabolism detected. Thank you, Sabine. Do we have other general questions for all the speakers here? Um, as yet, I have specific questions. I had a question for um, Dr. Frankovic about the connection between her research and the and MECFS project by uh, Ron Davis. Could you elaborate on uh, that? Yeah, so um, he is on our scientific board and I'm on his and we're um, trying to um, collaborate and he's definitely given us a lot of valuable input. Um, I think right now he's focused um, understandably on the really severe cases. The cases of chronic fatigue that we have are not nearly as severe as the cases he's studying. Um, but I think intellectually there's definitely overlap. Thank you. And um, um, someone was wondering on the chat uh, whether uh, we spoke already about the role of mitochondria. Um, um, this was a patient whose doctor said that all her problems are because of a defect in mitochondria. And uh, could you maybe elaborate on that? Yeah, maybe I can start just saying that uh, we see that there is a disturbed energy production in uh, in many of the patients and uh, uh, we measure that and we don't know if it's a secondary marker or if it's a, a primary marker, but I, I'm very much interested in trying to break down the path, uh, the pathways that are related to energy production in the mitochondria and see if we can figure out where the, where the problem is. So just as a sort of a general point, um, you know, the energy production can be influenced in a lot of different ways. And I think it's sort of important to keep that in mind. So for example, viruses must hijack their host cells energy. That's how they work. They're not really alive. And so to do anything at all, they need an energy source from somewhere else. And so that's part of how viruses work is they hijack the host cells metabolism so that they can produce raw materials and things like that. So um, there, are, there are sort of multiple pathways, um, including rare variants that may lead to mitochondrial dysfunction. And at least the way that I think about it is there may be sort of a shared endpoint, but that we probably ought to think about possible different ways to get there if you're going to help people get out of it. That's my opinion. Is there anything known about autoantibodies directed against mitochondria? Because that's been suggested in neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease. Is anything known about MECFS in regards to the OT autoantibody responses? Uh, there are some ongoing studies right now in lint shopping in Sweden uh, directing that uh, question, actually. So um, I'm not sure yet if they how far they have come in that study, but it's uh, it's a very interesting thought. It is, yes, for sure. Sabine, any other questions? Um, I have a question here by Eva Lehmann. Uh, she asks whether there are yet hypotheses about where the light and sound, uh, light, sound, and chemical sensitivity come from. Hmm. So, well, yeah. I could. I could talk a little bit about that if that's okay. Um, so, I mean, generally speaking, um, there are somewhat predictable patterns of neuroinflammation. So Dr. Frankovic uh, 
mention the basal ganglia, which is really important for sort of um, motivated behavior, and you know it's really sort of densely vascularized. Um, the the thalamus in the middle of the brain is a relay station through which all almost all sensory information comes in and then goes. You know, you know, we process vision in the back of the head, right, in the occipital lobe, but it goes through thalamus first. Um, and it's also one of the structures that's most prone to, to neuroinflammation, uh, to glial activation. It's one of the structures that was activated in the Nakatomi 2014 paper. Um, and so generally speaking, when there's neuroinflammation, the thalamus is also kind of inflamed. There's normally a nucleus around the thalamus called the reticular nucleus that acts like kind of a filter um, that ought to sort of prevent uh, amplification of uh, sensory sounds, things like that. It may be the case, I think it's a reasonable hypothesis that that, um, that system is not working as well in, in conditions of neuroinflammation. And so we know, for example, in autism, um, that there by, by magnetic resonance spectroscopy, that there seems to be um, uh, inflammation in that same structure. And that may be at least part of why senses can be so aversive and, and so amplified. Thank you. I have a question here. What would be the most adequate control uh, group for clinical studies? Um, most studies now use healthy controls. Uh, would we need to look at sedentary in individuals or other patient groups? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, totally healthy controls are probably not maybe the, most, the best way of uh, comparing. So. We, we, if we have possibilities, we want to follow the same individual over time, as we said. So you use yourself as the control, but also uh, contrast patient groups. Like um, in our case, we we follow multiple sclerosis patients, for instance, and look at uh, look at them. Uh, and I think that is we can learn something about uh, on autoimmunity from the MS uh, pattern mechanisms, and then relate that to what's going on in ME, for instance. So. And then the, something else would I mentioned also when you look at a uh, patient with uh, more severe encephalitis uh, type of diseases, then we can learn from those kind of events and, and also say something more about the neuroinflammation process that take care takes uh, occurs in the MECFS patients. Thank you, uh, Jonas. I think, uh, Sabine, we have time. No, we don't have any time anymore. I'm very strict here because uh, it's, it's, it's tiring to, to have this meeting on a screen. Um, I really like to wrap up this session. Uh, thank you all of you for your wonderful presentations, Jenny and Mike and Jonas. And um, in my opinion, it was very inspiring. And I hope this also accounts for, for the audience. Um, we have a break now. And um, I'm asking the audience to attend the meeting again at uh, 4.30. Um, so have a nice break. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.